it would be inconsiderate for me <laughs> not to begin with some kind of mention of the World Series champion Chicago Cubs. <laughs> In a recent interview with Patrick Mooney, our incomparable manager Joe Madden said this about statistics. I'm all about the geeks. Everybody should have their own geek. Dennis, Vena, Dennis Venema is my geek. I think that's a cheer for the Cubs. It was fairly tepid. But I have other geeks, including Jeffrey Schloss with BioLogos, and especially for me, Roseanne Sension, who was a part of BioLogos. It was her contributions to my blog that put science faith discussions back on my mind, or perhaps I could put it this way. It was her constant blogging about science and faith that made it a subject impossible for me to avoid. I'll show this on the screen. I've never used PowerPoint in my life. I don't even know what happens, so. I come from a preacher tradition, and we don't use pictures. Sorry. So these people are my geeks, and I want to enter in now between an interaction of geekdom and Bibledom. All right? And I begin with students. This discussion is lashed with heavy ropes to deep traditions and intense emotions. And I saw this on the faces and heard it from the lips of two kinds of students when I was teaching undergraduates an introduction to the Bible class. My conservative students were frightened by the prospect of the Bible being wrong, and so they were afraid of evolution. Better to keep it suppressed. You could call it whatever kind of evolution you wanted, theistic, or creationary evolution, or evolutionary creationism, or just plain old Darwinian evolution, it's the term evolution that created the problem. The other students were science students, who as those conservative students were worrying about evolution, these students were worrying about the Bible and its truthfulness. For them, if they were to hear yet again that belief in evolution was dangerous, or that the Bible teaches six-day creationism, or that the earth was only a few decades of thousands of years old, they would no longer be able to trust the Bible. The pastoral resources for conservative students abound, whether one likes what these sources say or not. The pastoral resources for science students that I had in my class are hard to find. Thanks to BioLogos for making these available. So we may well need some geeks, but we also need some geeks with pastoral gifts, like Dennis Venema. Or we need some theologians with pastoral skills. Adam and Genome, and the Genome, is for the science student who both believes in evolution, and insert here your favorite adjective, and then in the Bible as well, and wants to find a way to avoid a crisis of conscience and faith. I have said this more than once, but it must be repeated to keep before our eyes the significance of this topic. The number one reason young people walk away from the faith is the conflict of their interpretation of Scripture with their interpretation of science. Let it be emphasized that we are dealing here with the interpretation of Scripture, not necessarily Scripture's truest meaning. And yes, we are dealing with a theoretical construct called evolution. And the big yes is that for many, the two are implacable enemies. Some scientists think we are fools for believing in the Bible and therefore in Jesus, while for some conservative theologians and pastors, and bloggers, scientists are materialists, atheists, and those who think they are Christian and evolutionists are oblivious to the slippery slide they are halfway down. I want to respond now to, um, this is not in the book, so it's free. 
and Jeremy was very subtle in his advertisement for our book. My subtle one is, I don't care if you read it as long as you buy it. <laughs> I am sometimes told that science is always changing. And I heard this from Jack Collins in Oxford recently. So it is not populists who are making such accusations about the untrustworthiness of science. While my reading of this discussion is that nutrition science may always be changing about cholesterol, right now it's on the upside, evolution as a theory is not so much changing as it is expanding its comprehension and comprehensiveness of explanatory power. I shall make now a countercharge about my own field and say this, theology is always changing. N.T. Wright, you heard of this guy? He can come along and say, we got heaven all wrong for all these years. And we got justification wrong for all these years. And we got the atonement wrong for all these years. We got Jesus wrong for all these years. We got Paul wrong for all these years. My friends on the reform side of the ledger will say, we got all these themes right in the Reformation, and we've been right, and right is getting these things wrong. <laughs> now let's be honest. If for four weeks in a row, you go to five typical evangelical, non-denominational, or barely denominational churches, and listen to pastors preach, it is highly likely that you will hear five distinct, if not different, configurations about Christian theology and a big vision for God in this world. Who's changing now? I don't mean this to be cynical. I mean it from the heart. The reason evangelical Christians are so easily persuaded that science is always changing is because they indwell a symbolic world that differs so much from the symbolic world of other Christians. I'd like then to suggest that the closest parallels to science in the symbolic world construct of theology is not among evangelicals in the low church configurations, but among Roman Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, and among strong confessionalists like the truly Reformed, who quippingly call themselves the TRs. What I mean is that this form of traditional theology operates as science does, some basic conclusions that are indisputable, like the Trinity, the Creed, and a particular understanding of justification, and they are firmly articulated in creedal or confessional statements. Those lines are expanded and challenged and refreshed, but remain organically if not staunchly the same, over centuries of endurance. Catholic theology of the Eucharist, Orthodox theology of nature and spirit, justification for the truly Reformed just haven't changed, even if they have expanded in their explanatory powers. Take, for instance, the Trinity. The only reason Wayne Grudem and Bruce Ware got by with their diversion from historic Trinitarian thinking was because they were in a theology is always changing, let's go back to the Bible, we may have gotten this wrong circle. Theologians of the historic tradition of theology knew immediately that Bruce Ware and Wayne Grudem were wrong, if not more than wrong. That's a subtle word. They knew this because of the wisdom of the tradition, a tradition that was rooted in gospel and the Bible and that grew slowly, incrementally, and organically. The wisdom of neither theology nor science always gets it right. The wisdom of each is that it can be revisited and revised and reshaped, but it is only because of the respect of the tradition that it permits revision. I'll dig just a little bit deeper in this debate. 
Among many low church evangelicals today, there is a profound disrespect for tradition and for the elites of the tradition, and therefore a profound belief in their own mental capacities to start all over again, which creates some very interesting and at times helpful theology, but far more often messier, inarticulate, and profoundly wrong theology. That disrespect feeds into disrespect for any intellectual discipline's tradition. I have heard well-known theologians who agree only with themselves and a few of their students <laughs> trash science as an ideology, all to say that the only way some of our conservative brothers and sisters can dismiss the gains of science is because their theology breeds a contempt of tradition. It is my respect for how science operates and how traditional theology works that have led me to this conclusion. To accuse science of always changing is an accusation that is disrespectful, if not unaware, of the way science expands and grows and develops. It is also a sign of my respect for traditional theology. We would do better to take the wisdom tradition as our model for how both science and theology are to be done than radical revolutions like the Reformation or the Evangelical Awakening. Of course, we must go back to the Bible. I'm a Protestant. But what I've seen is that we need to go back to the Bible more because we've lost the great tradition, solid interpretive history, and because we too often hear mind-boggling silliness at the hands of some today. Oh. Better than booze. <laughs> so now I turn to the historical Adam. The most common question I have been asked in my academic career, other than the genre of Q question, <laughs> the most common question whenever I mention Genesis 1 through 3, is this. Do you believe in the historical Adam? The problem I face when I'm asked this question is my respect for the church's tradition and for the theology that has grown around some early church decisions. So I shall appeal to one of the greats in the church tradition, St. Augustine, who said, when natural scientists are able from reliable evidence to prove some fact of physical science, we shall show that it is not contrary to Scripture. That's exactly what Dennis Venema just said. I believe in Adam and the genome. I followed Augustine's rule to listen to the geeks who put more than serious questions to how some in the tradition have interpreted Adam and Eve and Genesis 1 through 3 and have, in fact, some ways proven that interpretation that we use is contrary to good science. What to do? Augustine says, think again and show from a different angle what the Bible meant in its world. But now back to the question, do I believe in the historical Adam? Over time, I became convinced, I became convinced that the word historical, when combined with the word Adam, and his usually neglected partner, Eve. Nobody's ever asked me if I believe in the historical Eve. <laughs> if that isn't a revelation, I don't know what is. I think you need two. <laughs> Mitochondrial or whatever. <laughs> and they got alleles and everything else that doesn't make sense. What I became convinced was that this expression, historical Adam, was loaded with theological meaning, depth, and traditions. For years, I listened and took notes on what was meant by historical Adam. The expression is theological, and it requires a specific kind of historical Adam for that theology to remain fully intact. I cite as my example the book, Four Views of the Historical Adam broken into the evolutionary creation view, no historical Adam, the archetypal creation view, there's a historical Adam, the old earth and young earth creation views, the historical Adam. 
Notice how each of these is pinned to the wall on its view of the historical Adam, all of which provokes what historical Adam means. And in Adam and the genome, I sorted this out into six elements, which I now want to restate with slight expressions for clarity. This is what I think people mean when they say, do you believe in the historical Adam? It starts with this. The historical Adam refers to two actual, real, and usually only two humans, Adam and Eve, who were created out of the dirt and a rib, the real Adam and Eve. The second is that historical Adam refers to those two real human beings having a biological and procreative relationship with every human being who has ever lived. So it becomes sort of a biological and genealogical Adam and Eve. And I want to say that I think the Bible's authors knew nothing about what we mean by the word biology today. Third, the historical Adam refers to those two humans, therefore, carrying the DNA of all humans who descended from Adam and Eve, genetic Adam and Eve. The historical Adam refers to those, fourth, those two humans who sinned and who died from that sin and who therefore brought death upon all human beings by their singular sin, the fallen Adam and Eve. Fifth, the historical Adam therefore also refers to those two human beings, Adam and Eve, passing on, however it is explained, passing on their sin natures to all their descendants, and the implication now is that all human beings are born as sinners, condemned before God because of the sin of those two real humans, and I call this the sin nature, Adam and Eve. And sixth, all human beings need redemption because of the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden and passing on that sin nature to all humans. Redemption, then, required is, is required because of Adam and Eve. So that means the gospel is at stake if you deny number one. This construction, now this is my attempt to put together what I think people are asking me when they talk about the historical Adam and Eve. I don't think many of them are going to articulate it that way, but that's what they're getting at. If, if, if I don't answer, do you believe in the historical Adam, right at the beginning, then they'd think that I've denied the gospel of, uh, of redemption. This construction of theology of the Adam and Eve owes its origin in some ways, not to Genesis or to the Old Testament or to Judaism's teachings about Adam and Eve, but to Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, when read in a very specific way. One is not far off base if one says this historical Adam construct derives more from Jerome and Augustine than from the Old Testament or Judaism, and probably also not from the Apostle Paul. In this historical Adam construct, then, Adam is a theological Adam who is best described as the sin nature Adam. I'm neither afraid nor averse to this understanding of Adam and Eve. I've read a number of books over the years that teach this, none more enjoyable than Alan Jacobs' book, Original Sin. I was asked the other day, though, this question, do you believe in original sin? I said, I'm a Bible guy, so it doesn't matter what I believe. I want to know if the Bible teaches original sin. The questioner was not staggered one bit and came back, no, I want to know what you personally think. I said, I'm a Bible guy, and my quest is how the Bible answers that question. But do you, what do you believe, he said, and I wanted to say B-I-B-L-E. <laughs> it didn't work. We weren't getting anywhere. So I'll tell you, I personally like the idea of original sin. It, make lo it makes loads of sin of my experience in this world. But my experience runs face to face with the Bible, and now by the geeks. Before the Bible, the geeks deserve a, a brief word, genome theory. 
I will leave it to Dennis the Geek to explain this. But unless I'm mistaken, there never was only two solitary human beings on planet Earth from whom we have descended and from whom we get our DNA, or something like that. St. Augustine said, when natural scientists are able from reliable evidence to prove some fact of physical science, we shall show that it is not contrary to Scripture. If the evidence is reliable and the little flippers on whales and the DNA in chimps and evolution of the superior cubs from the inferior Yankees. <laughs> hashtag boom. <laughs> then we have, as Bible guy, a challenge to show that the Bible is not wrong. I happen to like Augustine's framework because it is mine. I begin with the assumption that the Bible is truthful and right and not wrong. Some call this inerrancy. I like to call it truthfulness. My experience is that when I encountered genome theory, I was undone in my ability to explain Genesis 1 through 3 as being ex explicable only by talking about the various options. My science students wanted something that respected science as Augustine showed it respect himself. This led me to people like John Walton and J. Richard Middleton and others who have explored Genesis 1 through 3 as an ancient Near Eastern text interacting with other ancient Near Eastern creation narratives. The primary mode of interpretation then is to read it as a theological text over against other theological claims, as the claim of the one true God over against false idols and gods as the claim that both man and woman image God as divine representatives in this world, as two humans with assignment and vocation in this world to protect and expand the goodness of God's creation. It led me to wonder about the genre of Genesis 1 through 3, and I remain both unsettled and agnostic about the categories that are used. I don't like the term myth, and I don't like fable, and I don't like legend. I like theological narrative. It begs the question that others want answers to, but I have no answer to that question of genre. When I read a text that names a male dusty or clay or earthling and a female fashioned from the side of a rib of dusty and named mama of all living humans, and when I read of a serpent that talks and actually fools people made in God's image, I do have to ask questions about genre. For all the tragedy, there's also something tragic comedic about this text too. When I see Adam incorporated into a genealogy, I'm asked other questions. I don't have answers, and I'm open to better readings, and I read the text as a theological narrative about God as creator, about humans as assigned by God to a vocation in God's cosmic temple on God's sacred time, and I see the tragedy of humans who refuse to do what God said, and after all, it just couldn't be that hard not to eat that fruit. That, too, is a part of the narrative for me, the foolishness of humans, the exile of humans to some place in the east, echoing the exile of Judah to Babylon, and I could go on. I, I blame the geeks for forcing me to rethink how I was reading Genesis, and I blame Augustine for giving me the liberty to do so. So Adam in Judaism and Paul, my last section. Recall what I mean by historical Adam. That historical Adam construct of seven elements, I asked myself, was it to be found in Judaism? Thanks to the very solid work of Jack Levison, and then slightly updated by Philippe de Jesus Legarata Castillo, the figure of Adam in the world of Judaism has been thoroughly examined. What I learned from rereading those texts in the ancient world, which was more than fun for me, was that Adam was a character in the Bible who could be formed and reformed and shaped and reshaped according to the theological agenda of an individual author. Thus, the Adam of Sirach, was that he was an archetypal moral Adam and Eve. 
From the wisdom of Solomon, who was not theologically the same as Sirach, Adam became in his hands the immoral just Adam of wisdom. The immortal. Immoral. And while in the hands of Philo the Alexandrian, Adam was fashioned into the logos and wisdom and mind of his own Neoplatonic thinking. I will stop there to repeat my larger point. Adam, and only sometimes Eve, were fashioned more or less into archetypes of God's demand upon humans who failed to do God's will and therefore became archetypes of disobedience. They are thus negative constructs to provide Jews with counterexamples of obedience. And the authors of those texts are exhorting Jews to be Torah observant, faithful, obedient, and wise. But it all began with their belief in the Bible. The Adam of the Bible I call the literary Adam. I make no judgment when I say literary Adam about historicity or non-historicity. The Adam of the Bible is what the Jews all believed in. They were not running DNA tests. They knew nothing about what we call biology. They weren't doing archaeology, and neither were they examining fossils to determine the age of the earth. Their Bible told them about Adam, and they believed their Bible. The Adam of Judaism, I concluded, was not the historical Adam construct of Christian theology. There is precious little reflection on how Adam passed on his sin, though at some level he precipitated sin. They have no statements about sin nature being passed on by procreation. They don't have what we would call a federal representation of all humans in Adam and Eve, at least that I'm aware of. Perhaps the idea of archetype breaches the waters of federalism, but those Jewish texts are a long way from later Reformed theology on federalism. Briefly now to Paul, I make these observations. First, the Adam of Paul in Romans 5 is the literary Adam of Genesis, probably also the genealogical Adam and seemingly the image of God Adam. But most important, he was the man who was summoned to obedience and he didn't. Paul ignores Eve in the book of Romans. Second, the Adam of Paul has echoes of the Jewish tradition's interpretation. Third, to further the second point about Paul and Judaism's Adam, most especially, once again, the Adam of Paul is the moral Adam who was disobedient. The Adam of Paul was the man who chose to sin. Adam, for Paul, is everyone. Fourth, and here it gets tricky and we have to be careful, Paul lays blame on humans, not because they were born sinners or because of their sin nature, but because, like Adam, they choose to sin. This is what Romans 5.12 said, because all sinned, F-ho. How Adam and Eve is connected to the obvious sin behavior of all humans is simply not stated by the Apostle Paul. Original sin is a good theory, but Paul doesn't seem to believe in it. Or better yet, it is not clear to me that he teaches it. Maybe he believes in it. This leads me to now nuanced statement. The Adam of Paul is not the historical Adam. And I mean by that the historical Adam construct of those six or seven points. By that I mean he believes some of those elements... But the connection between Adam as sinner and you and I as sinners is not spelled out as it was later spelled out by theologians like Augustine, Luther, and Calvin. I express my thanks now in this room to the geeks who informed me about genome theory and to Joe Madden who gave me a line and the hope that the Cubs will win the World Series again. Thank you.